Good morning and welcome back uh, to everyone here at Opera for Educators for Peleus and Melisande. Uh, so let's keep on a rolling. Um, we have actually a, a new presenter. We're, we, we love bringing back our, our beloved scholars, but it's a thrill to welcome a, a, a new great mind um, to, with expertise to share with all of you today. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, give you a brief introduction to Julia, Dr. Julia Friedman. She is a Russian-born art historian, writer, and curator. She received her PhD in art history from Brown University in 2005 and has since researched and taught in the US, UK, and Japan. Her transdisciplinary work on European modernism, Russian immigration, and book art resulted in the illustrated monograph Beyond Symbolism and Surrealism, Alexei Remezov's Synthetic Art, published by Northwestern University Press in 2011. She has been a regular contributor to Art Forum and has a blog column in the Huffington Post. Um, in 2017, she also began writing for the new uh, Criterion magazine. Uh, and this area of her, her expertise is really fascinating to me. Uh, Friedman's most recent publications are on Wayne Thiebaud's clown series, the artist, uh, the painter Wayne Thiebaud, and that has been the focus of her research since spring of 2018. Hour of the Clown, the initial introduction of the series Cultural Context, came out in June of 2019 and was followed with another 2019 article, There Ought to Be Clowns, about the genesis of the series. series. Another longer essay, Nothing is Unimportant, will come out in Thibault's Centennial Exhibition Catalog to be published in conjunction with the multi-venue show slated to open in October of 2020 at Sacramento Cocker, at the, the Sacramento Crocker Museum of Art, really fine museum. Uh, she is presently working on Wayne Thibault's uh, portraiture, and I was very interested particularly because uh, Wayne Thibault was in the art department at UC Davis when I was doing my graduate work there. So it's a great pleasure to listen to and learn from Dr. Julia Friedman. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you for the uh, generous introduction. Let's see if I can manage to share my screen properly. Okay, <laughs> right. let's get rolling. Okay, um, uh, so uh, I am going to talk about um, uh, their historical side of it. Uh, but since we're talking about symbolism, necessarily we have to uh, uh, vacillate between uh, uh, literature and uh, musical inspirations as we talk about uh, painting. And uh, one thing that I'd like to uh, say from the outset, there's no, uh, we can, while uh, uh, there are themes and ideas that are very important and um, are being exchanged and kind of uh, mulled over by uh, all the symbolists and uh, symbolist sympathizers, um, there's no, we cannot think of a direct translation, so to say, of, say musical impressionism, whatever stands for that, uh, to, to uh, uh, visual impressionism. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not going in that direction. Uh, but uh, uh, the connections uh, between um, uh, all, uh, uh, varieties of symbolism were quite stunning. So I'm starting out uh, with this uh, top slide uh, where I just took a detail of a painting I'll come back to uh, later on. The painting is by a very celebrated uh, uh, muralist. He's known as a muralist originally, but, but uh, um, also a painter, uh, Puvi de Chavannes, uh, a French uh, painter. Uh, who was uh, a true, uh, one of the true 19th century um, painters, rock stars, uh, the original ones. And the painting is called The Dream. Uh, so that's a, a very good cue for what's gonna happen. So uh, with symbolism, we have, uh, symbolism just as some other uh, movements in art history has uh, a specific point that we can, uh, we can uh, uh, discuss in terms of when it started, uh, because there was a manifesto, there was a statement um, as to uh, 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 what the movement represents. So the symbolist manifesto was published in uh, September of 1886. 
It was penned uh, by um, Jean Marais, who was a Greek poet living in uh, Paris at the time. And uh, he chose a Le Figaro literary supplement as the venue, which is very important in itself because this is the most important newspaper. So that kind of tells you about the intentions of, of uh, uh, marking uh, the ground, so to say. All right. Uh, so here's a quote. Uh, I have uh, quite a few quotes uh, in my talk today and just, you know, so you don't, you don't suffer too much from my accent and my reading. I put them up and uh, all the uh, bold um, uh, emphasis are mine. Uh, if they're italics, they're by uh, the people who are uh, saying things. So uh, here's an excerpt uh, from Marais's manifesto. He's talking about literature. Uh, an enemy of didactic pursuits, of declamation of false sensitivity, of objective description, symbolist poetry endeavors to clause the idea in the form perceptible to the senses that nevertheless does not constitute an ultimate goal in itself, but while helping to convey the idea remains subordinate. The essential character of symbolic art is never to reach the idea itself. Um, this uh, last uh, phrase is really, really crucial uh, for uh, um, really uh, understanding symbolism because um, uh, big uh, um, part of the movement in all its manifestations is this uh, inability to uh, find uh, a clear and, uh, and kind of a finite singular explanation. Uh, symbolism works in a completely opposite uh, fashion, in fact. Uh, so uh, it opposes, uh, we can kind of go from the negatives, it opposes naturalism, it opposes in which in painting would be represented by uh, the realist movement, it opposes uh, empirical clarity, and, uh, uh, but mainly uh, it is uh, kind of a, a way of thinking that that has uh, suggestion and its core as uh, rather than description of appearances. So you, you have the hints, uh, you have the little bits which your subconscious puts together in a way. Um, so uh, this is all fine. So we have the 1886 date, but actually um, symbolism, and that's um, uh, uh, not, not, not a controversial statement, uh, has been before its official announcement, it, essentially was expressed very clearly uh, in a poem uh, published in this uh, uh, volume, uh, uh, The Flowers of Evil uh, by Charles Baudelaire. Um, the, the, uh, poems, um, the poem was written in, and this is a later edition that you have on the screen. The poem is from 1857. Uh, Baudelaire uh, was uh, uh, a hugely important uh, uh, critic uh, as well as a poet. And uh, this poem is considered to be the um, kind of the keystone for what symbolism would uh, mean and what it would imply. Uh, if you look at the, um, so the second stanza here, you have in the last line, you, you have uh, different um, uh, senses intermingling. Uh, so basically the, the, the sonnet does, it evokes the nature as the metaphor of the temple. And the temple has the tree-like pillars that are alive. And so uh, the correspondences, uh, which is in the title of the sonnet, are the links between those uh, different sensory and spiritual uh, facets. And uh, so it is uh, 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 almost kind of a common search for rhythm in uh, different uh, sensory realms. And uh, so the, the rhythm, uh, which is, uh, has its own uh, manifestation in poetry is uh, a key uh, point here. So for the symbolist, correspondences uh, really linked uh, senses to spirit. Um, and uh, musicality, uh, is a uh, really important uh, uh, factor here because it links it links the uh, 
uh, harmony, the rhythm, the movement, uh, and formal abstraction. Uh, so uh, it's it's interesting that Baudelaire also talks about um, uh, he he almost gets uh, uh, very very close to talking about uh, abstraction uh, as he talks about melody. Uh, at some point, he wrote um, the appropriate way to determine uh, when a painting is melodious is to look at it from a distance as to be unable to comprehend the subject or its lines. It is melodious. If it is melodious, it is already has a meaning that has taken its place in the repertory of memories. In other words, you do not need the narrative. You do not need kind of the empirical layout of the facts. Uh, you have something uh, which is uh, uh, much uh, more subtle in the artwork, uh, which doesn't require um, uh, comprehending it um, in terms of visual logic. So um, correspondences fuse and infuse the senses, uh, the hearing, the sight here, the smell and the touch uh, with mystery. Uh, and that is the holy grail that uh, all the symbolists are chasing, uh, this sort of uh, uh, effusive um, quality of all the manifestations. And remember, the idea is not supposed to be uh, spelled out and uh, completely uh, made clear. Uh, so this is a lovely uh, colored uh, photograph uh, of Baudelaire, uh, which um, now it makes me think of the, the 3D mode uh, on the iPhone pictures, very vivid. Um, so, uh, but Lair, when he was talking about his ideas of, of uh, um, uh, those corresponding sensations and elements, uh, they're actually based in uh, his writing, uh, in, in large part, in his writing about painting. <clears throat> in, 19, in 1846, he wrote a very famous uh, review of um, uh, the 1846 Salon. Uh, and as he was discussing, uh, a great uh, romanticist uh, painter, Eugene uh, Delacroix, uh, he talked about the uh, awareness, Delacroix's awareness of um, aesthetic potential of vagueness. Because Delacroix, of course, is known for his ability to rely on, on uh, uh, the music of color. And he was quite vocal about the musical quality of his painting. And so um, this emphasis on the mystery and the vagueness and the obscurity and confusion um, that um, creates uh, associations and it creates clashes of associations, which is very important because again, you don't want the clarity, you just want um, the aura there. And so, um, but Lair was really quite aware uh, about uh, of, of uh, how, uh, if you address the question of dreams, uh, then this uh, subconscious uh, quality uh, really comes to the fore and it's much easier uh, to uh, be uh, in the flow away from your conscious mundane uh, concerns. So um, uh, this is um, uh, a quote from another piece of writing from uh, roughly the same time uh, that uh, where Baudelaire Larry talks um, about um, uh, uh, another artist, uh, but so here's what he says. Um, what is surprising in the life of dreams is not so much to find oneself transported into fantastic regions in which all accepted behavior has become confused, all established ideas contradicted, where frequently the impossible mingles with the real. So that is the uh, key. So it is not a complete um, uh, relegation of uh, reality, uh, but it is this um, very uh, strange liminal space where the dream is informed by reality and we really don't know when uh, one begins and the other one ends. Uh, so uh, again, the question here, and this is something that he's stressing, is this uh, inability to resolve, inability to transcend. And uh, um, as uh, uh, we just heard from Holly, uh, the um, uh, this um, uh, amazing, um, uh, uh, so the, the, the kind of the symphonic uh, uh, clarity uh, which you see in uh, 
uh, Wagner, this is this is the part that that uh, um, Debussy loses along the way, essentially uh, because it is not about transcendence, uh, and uh, what he presents is something much more akin to uh, the modern ambivalence about uh, everything. Uh, so uh, the uh, famous uh, uh, 1846 Salon, so this is from this uh, bit of writing about uh, Delacroix. Uh, so he's talking about Delacroix here. Uh, what is this mysterious uh, je ne sais quoi that Delacroix has uh, translated better than anyone else? It is the invisible, it is the impalpable, it is the dream, it is the nerves, it is the soul. Um, uh, so the artist then uh, is, uh, and this is Baudelaire's big idea, uh, which has a huge influence on the, the rest of, on his uh, symbolist followers, is that um, there is this doubling, uh, dédoublement uh, in French, of the artist. So at, the artist is at once a, an observer, a passionless observer, and uh, a scientist. Uh, so the artist brings in uh, both facets and uh, you have this dreamlike detachment uh, of the symbolist uh, where uh, on one hand uh, uh, they're uh, expressing something but they're not giving you enough empirical um, uh, path of crumbs to really uh, figure out what it is about. You have to compile your own. And eventually this uh, factor of spectators participation is going to be something that is very characteristic of uh, modernist uh, and modern uh, understanding of art. Uh, but in symbolism, you have um, uh, this constant kind of uh, air of uh, sleepwalking and somnambulism. And again, uh, so just as has uh, been mentioned uh, uh, in the previous talk, uh, the, uh, some of the criticisms of uh, the, the opera have to do with uh, accusations of the actor sleepwalking or being somnambulistic, uh, but uh, you know, that was completely intended. Uh, so uh, the other um, uh, the other name that already came up uh, in the first presentation is uh, a hugely important uh, critic uh, uh, of 19th century, uh, uh, great great essayist and fiction writer, and probably one of the greatest stylists ever. Uh, so I didn't I didn't dare to cut his quote. Uh, Walter Pater. Walter Pater here talks about William Morris's poetry. And uh, I brought up this quote because I thought that uh, kind of based on the criticism again of the play, the immediate and the immediate aftermath, uh, it could really, uh, of the opera, it could really apply to the opera. So he's talking about Morris. Here in Provencal court poetry of the Middle Ages, again, this kind of medieval um, uh, themed uh, um, art, art. Under this strange com complex of conditions, as in some medicated air, exotic flowers of sentiment expand among people of remote and unaccustomed beauty, some nimbalistic, frail, androgynous, the light almost shining through them as the flame of a little taper shows through the host. Such loves were too fragile and adventurous to last more than for a moment. The whole religion of the Middle Age was but a beautiful disease or a disorder of the senses um, and a religion which is a disorse, disorder of the senses must always be subject to illusions. Reverie, illusion, delirium. They are three stages of fatal descent, both in the religion and the loves of the middle ages. So, and again, this is uh, uh, really quite uh, before uh, the opera had materialized. Um, I'm uh, fudging here a little bit. I was hoping to find uh, a slide of the first scene, uh, which I, I couldn't garnish, uh, garner on the internet. So um, uh, this is uh, Mary Garden uh, during the, um, uh, the, the, um, her hair song. Um, I wanted to bring this one up because I thought that it is a really, um, uh, the, the, the first, uh, the first scene when uh, um, uh, in the forest, uh, 
the first scene uh, is really uh, kind of a, a prime example of this dreamlike intensity. Uh, when uh, you have, um, uh, this is, which is completely consistent with Debussy's aspirations as it was expressed uh, in his uh, uh, little, uh, in his uh, 1890 letter uh, where he's talking uh, about um, uh, kind of the, the ideal, he's, well, not the ideal, the, the, what he's aiming for, no time, no place, the, the, the kind of opera that he's aiming for, no time, no place, no big scene, music in the opera is far too predominant, too much singing and the musical settings are too cumbersome. My idea is of a short libretto with mobile scenes, no discussion or arguments between the characters whom I see is a, at, whom I see at the mercy of life and destiny. So this is a really important uh, little bit of information. Um, the figures being at the mercy of life and destiny makes them into subjects and not kind of the acting objects. So the typical operatic drama um, is uh, uh, bled out of uh, symbolist uh, plays and symbolist opera uh, because the, the actors becomes uh, acted uh, upon by some uh, invisible forces. Uh, they await action. There is a certain passivity. Again, this was one of the criticism that was hurled at uh, the opera in the beginning that, that not, they were uh, not uh, uh, propelling uh, their own fates. Uh, Melisande is much more of an example here because she uh, uh, removes herself. Uh, she she uh, doesn't try to fight her fate, but she is not she's not uh, uh, trying to um, uh, she's not embracing it either. So she's she's completely completely passive, and so uh, this is uh, precisely why uh, uh, when uh, uh, Debussy uh, and uh, was looking um, for a proper libretto, uh, Metterling's uh, writing, and uh, this was not the first uh, piece he, he tried to go for, but, but this was the first one he landed, uh, was a perfect, perfect libretto for him uh, because uh, it was concentrating on the symbolic life, inner life of the characters, as opposed to the action and the drama and uh, kind of the usual operatic um, uh, happening. So, uh, amidst your link, uh, we have uh, a few uh, kind of juicy bits from him. Uh, he, of course, uh, also uh, talked about what he wanted of, of uh, the place. And uh, it is a well-known fact that he was quite vocal about the evils of theater. Um, uh, he, uh, uh, really uh, thought that, um, uh, so this is kind of a positive uh, uh, quote that you're looking at on the screen, the theater is a temple of dreams, art always seems evasive and never speaks face to face. So there's a problem um, because theater must engage and be expressive, right? So one might say it is the hypocrisy of the infinite. Uh, what he wants to do, he wants to uh, depersonalize physical things, physical beings on stage. Uh, he wants uh, to preserve the full mystery and the full uh, complexity of, uh, of um, uh, the life of the soul. And uh, all of his uh, dramas, uh, all of his plays are inevitably dedicated to the life of the soul. So here's the top quote is the predicament that he sees. That's the problem with theater. The stage is where masterpieces die because the presentation of the masterpiece by accidental, his emphasis and human means is a contradiction. All masterpieces are symbols and the symbol never withstands an active presence of man. Um, so what do you do? Uh, he has a very, very radical solution here. Uh, he says, uh, one, perhaps, uh, one should perhaps eliminate the living being from, a sta from the stage. Will the human being be replaced by a shadow, a reflection, a projection of symbolic forms, or a being who would appear to live without being alive? I don't know, but the absence of man seems essential to me. A poem uh, that I see being recited is always a lie. 
uh, a little bit of a wordplay on uh, uh, the Bible here. Um, so um, uh, this is really interesting. So he has the ambition, which is almost almost uh, ready to be achieved technologically. And again, we uh, saw uh, an excerpt uh, from a 1902 uh, movie. Uh, so yes, we could do the shadows, we could do the projections. I mean, now we can do the hologram appearances of um, um, uh, Michael Jackson. Uh, uh, so you could remove the fallible, the tangible human being. Uh, but of course, uh, music and the opera is about voices and it is about music. So you kind of have to keep that. And um, uh, so uh, perhaps uh, uh, make it so that the operatic components, the, uh, uh, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the way, uh, well, the arias uh, in the first instance, but the drama that builds up, the, de the decorations, the uh, exaggerated gestures, all of that, removal of that, and then uh, the viewer will uh, inevitably have to concentrate on the voices because that is going to be the only thing left. Uh, so this is a decoration set for uh, Mona Vanna from uh, 1909 from the uh, National Opera, uh, just to show you. So this is really kind of in tune with this idea of um, uh, very unspecific uh, uh, um, uh, way of uh, creating a background that opens your mind rather than suggests anything empirical. Um, so uh, uh, just to uh, kind of uh, 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 bring it in, in um, uh, uh, just to connect it to the opera at hand. Um, what's interesting uh, here is that in the opera, there are several scenes that take place at, at um, twilight and kind of changing light, and there's a night scene. And uh, this is not incidental at all. This is really important because this is uh, literally uh, the time when you don't have all of your facts together. So you have to deduce, you have to use your faculties of uh, perceiving correspondences. Uh, and, uh, and that is something that uh, Mitterlink was obviously in favor of. And this was harnessed by Debussy when he takes the text of the play and then he uh, cuts him himself. Uh, he removes uh, the scenes that were uh, unnecessary for the opera and he pairs it down further. So it becomes uh, even less material, even less, um, palpable, less uh, empirical, and uh, uh, it really helps the viewer to um, make this, um, uh, to create the, the uh, artwork uh, from the hints that are planted. And that requires uh, the traditional, not traditional, the uh, famously, uh, the static theater, uh, which Materlink is, known for. Um, so uh, uh, again, um, uh, this is not, not, to, not, to, not to press this point too much, but so when Mitterlink is talking about dematerialization, uh, he is um, uh, also uh, bringing up uh, the, the question of uh, intuition. And that is something that again comes up in uh, the opera uh, in Act Two, Scene Two, uh, when uh, Galat falls off his horse uh, while hunting, it happens. We know the precise time, and this is the precise time that Melisande drops her wedding ring uh, while she's uh, uh, hanging uh, out by the pool, uh, by the well, with uh, Peleus, and um, uh, something that she shouldn't have been doing probably. And uh, so you have this subconscious layer. So you have uh, the time correspondences and the intuition, intuitive events. Uh, and they're made real because they actually take place in real life. So uh, and the criticism that was hurled at the opera of the appearance of the half deaf somnambulist just awakening from a pa painful dream uh, is exactly what Mitterlink was uh, aiming for in his play and which was so brilliantly rendered uh, by Debussy. Um, uh, this image is actually kind of like a cautionary uh, 
this is what I mentioned at the very beginning. So this is a, um, an illustration uh, by uh, Cerizier. Uh, Cerizier, Paul Cerizier uh, and uh, Maurice uh, Dini, both uh, French artists, both are of the period. And there was a lot of cross contamination kind of culturally with the groups. And uh, it's all a bit complicated actually, because um, uh, so the, the problem uh, here is this. Um, the people who were in uh, personal uh, contact as friends and who attended the same salons uh, were not necessarily on the same uh, page artistically. And so uh, this is why it's really hard, uh, and that was my warning in the beginning, to kind of try to draw uh, parallel lines between uh, one uh, art form and another art form. So uh, you have this general idea of the unconscious being at the fore, but how do you uh, how do you um, uh, uh, implement it in a certain art form? So you can have, um, say, excessive linear marks. Uh, you can have uh, uh, obscured forms. Uh, you could have uh, various ways that support the idea of the unconscious mind, but they're going to translate. Uh, they're really hard. It would be quite a stretch to try to pull uh, the music and the representational uh, means together. Uh, so I propose that we should just be satisfied with the idea of the uh, shared ideals and the ideas. Um, so uh, uh, from the horse's mouth, um, uh, why I wrote Peleus uh, in the aftermath of the um, uh, performance, original performance, the drama of Peleus, which despite its dreamlike atmosphere contains far more humanity than those so-called real life documents seem to suit my intentions admirably. In it, uh, there is an evocative language whose sensitivity could be extended into music and into, uh, and into the orchestral backcloth. A really interesting statement because um, uh, this is, uh, so we're, we're not uh, uh, witnessing an instance of uh, a purposeful um, self-identification as uh, effect, uh, as aesthetism uh, in, in, in the art making, but rather uh, this is um, uh, the, the new way of much more clear expression, just as the facts perhaps uh, take uh, the back seat. Uh, and uh, so uh, both Mitterlink and Debussy uh, they were they were adamantly against uh, anything that was too present, uh, all the contingencies, the facts, the details, and uh, but they they wanted to represent the idea, and the feeling was the shared feeling was that um, the the it could be done uh, aesthetically through the negation of of representation through subordination of representation. And despite that last minute rift uh, 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 due to casting um, uh, uh, disagreements, um, uh, they were very, very much on uh, the same page creative, creatively. So, okay, so remember this quote from Marais where, where he's talking about the uh, kind of uh, the, the um, constant development and never reaching this goal, uh, uh, the, the idea never, never um, uh, reaches, it never reaches the idea itself, right? So uh, in the review, in one of the reviews of uh, um, Peleus, um, almost two decades after Marius's manifesto, uh, very uh, well respected and smart uh, symbolist uh, poet and critic Paul Verhan approached this subordination of representation uh, as he claimed that the work becomes the idea through evocation. So the correspondences manifest the idea. And uh, so it's not, it's not that the work becomes an idea ontologically, it really doesn't, but it, it becomes an idea experientially via imagination and uh, the viewers gain access to this idea through a series of uh, uh, promptings of different sensations. So the work essentially is an evocation. It's not an explanation, definitely not a representation. 
Um, so as Verkran uh, uh, said in in his uh, um, uh, in uh, his um, uh, article uh, that he wrote on um, sorry on uh, the symbolist Belgian uh, symbolist painter Fernand Knopf, uh, he, he says, in symbolism, fact and world become more pretext for ideas, pretext. They're handled as appearances, ceaselessly variable, and ultimately manifest themselves only as the dreams of our brains. The idea, whether responding to them or evoking them, determines their manifestation. Uh, so uh, you do not have um, uh, you do not have um, any uh, anything tangible to go on. It is all on the level of the intuitive. Uh, this is um, the artist that he was discussing, uh, who was so here. I'm kind of getting into more of um, uh, the visual component of my talk. Uh, which is essentially kind of almost boils down to showing you some images and pointing out some uh, key uh, themes and key topics that were uh, uh, manifested in the opera and uh, uh, very much heavily presented in the symbolist um, doctrine. So this one I pulled because it represents um, uh, this uh, kind of quintessentially eerie depiction uh, by a Belgian symbolist here of uh, a woman. Uh, I believe that uh, femme fatale uh, phenomenon was already briefly mentioned. Uh, so basically, the, the, uh, during um, uh, the, well, uh, these ideas took root during the second half of the 19th century uh, in, in terms of kind of general cultural understanding the uh, women who were seen alternatively as uh, the fatal dames who would destroy you or uh, the pure uh, characters that um, just kind of come out of nowhere. And Melisande is actually a wonderful example of uh, a figure that combines both because of course she, we don't know where she comes from. Uh, she's an innocent girl. Um, uh, but then uh, something switches when she begins to lie and uh, she uh, perhaps again she is being acted upon right um, she becomes a femme fatale of uh, her own uh, sort so this is a depiction this is uh, uh, something that kind of gives you this uh, really disturbing element and now uh, so to kind of the big this is um, uh, a very interesting uh, point this is again nope um, uh, the, the painting is called Caresses. So what is happening here is really quite complicated because this is a riff on uh, the, the story of the Sphinx, but not quite. So in Caresses, you have this, uh, this is his most famous painting, by the way. You have this mysterious beauty of the woman who is um, uh, uh, seducing uh, the man. And, and this woman is a devouring woman. She's uh, Satan. Uh, uh, in uh, Verhan's uh, uh, words, she's uh, as beautiful as death. Uh, and uh, uh, so again, there are all sorts of references to, uh, to Wiesmann's uh, novel um, uh, Against the Grain um, and uh, the decadent underpinnings. Uh, but uh, uh, so it brings up the story of the Sphinx. And so let me uh, explain to you briefly why that is so important. Uh, so this is an original, one of the early representations of the Sphinx by the great French painter Gustave Moreau. And you can see it's a really early on, uh, it's a really early uh, 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 painting as, as far as symbolism goes, but it's very much uh, a symbolist painting proto-symbolist, um, or historically, but symbolist in spirit. And what do you have here is you have, uh, of course, it, it is, uh, uh, it's a famous uh, uh, image of Oedipus who is uh, uh, trying to get through and the Sphinx uh, accosts him and asks a question. And the question is, uh, what is it that walks on all fours in the morning on two legs? Uh, in the day and on three legs in the afternoon, um, in the evening. 
And so the answer is it's a, it's a human being. We start as babes and then we walk upright and then we need a king. Um, so he answers it and he lives. Uh, but this, this idea of uh, the riddle, of the riddle, so you have this question that you have to answer. If you don't answer it, you die. And he answers it. So uh, how does it translate into the opera? Very interesting. Uh, of course, you have uh, uh, Galad asking uh, a lot of questions of Melisande and she never answers. Um, so, and, and everybody dies, right? Because the answer isn't there. Uh, but uh, again, if you kind of subscribe to this frame of symbolism that I've been trying to lay out, uh, which is unattainability, it's, it's um, kind of a collection of hints that you go by and there's no clear explanation, well, uh, then there's no answer, right? So you have it in both ways, but it's almost kind of like a, um, uh, there's no point in getting an answer uh, because this is not about uh, achieving any uh, sort of clarity. The other thing I'd like to point out here also is that, uh, of course, you have this uh, female figure, which is really quite uh, aggressive. And um, so this, the, the femme fatale element dominates. And it continues um, through uh, various uh, uh, symbolist um, uh, uh, painting. Uh, so again, here's a Moreau. Uh, and what he's doing here, he's showing uh, the uh, invisible to everybody. So Salome is dancing here in aftermath of the uh, execution of John the Baptist. She can see the head, nobody else can. So she is experiencing a vision, uh, which is kind of a, uh, almost a, in a way, it's a perfect, uh, it's a very, very perfect uh, explanation of uh, what happens in uh, symbolism. You, you can uh, relate uh, to uh, uh, a string of stimuli uh, that are uh, multi-sensory and uh, other things come out of it. So uh, I uh, could see that I'm running, uh, actually I'm not quite running out of time, so I'll just, I'll keep going for a little bit. Um, so uh, one of the most important uh, figures uh, visually, as far as uh, uh, Peleus the opera is concerned is uh, the, the celebrated uh, uh, painter Puvi de Chavan, uh, who, as I mentioned, was a true rock star at the time. He was hugely influential across Europe in practically every country. Um, and he became, uh, so he had in 1887, so uh, in, towards the end of the uh, uh, 80s, he had a, a big uh, show at the Durand Royal Gallery, which uh, made him a household name. Um, he said famously that his goal was to say as much as possible in a few words, in a few words. So visually, this is what he was doing. He was trying to create a composition which is uh, not uh, an explanation of facts, but rather something that gives you enough visual clues to set the mood in a really pared down way. And you have this world of fantasy and you have this world of this kind of somnambulistic existence. Uh, he's really well known for the paintings that uh, show uh, a very uh, uh, pronounced um, uh, religious references, obviously, so the reference to Christ here, but also uh, bring, bring up the idea of uh, the question of being lonely in the world, being uh, separated from others, quite a current uh, theme now, right? Um, uh, the, and above all, again, important for uh, uh, Peleus is the acceptance of life uh, hardships and kind of being acted upon as, uh, as uh, an object. Um, so uh, it's interesting because, uh, so in, uh, um, in the opera, let's see, uh, this question of um, isolation, contemplation, uh, uh, sin, uh, we have the love triangle, right, and mortality, we have the murders and the death, uh, they're all uh, at once, they're abstract and they're concrete. Uh, they're representational and they're literal just like in this painting. So this is Mary Magdalene. 
she's alone in the wilderness, uh, you know, per iconographic prescription. Uh, but uh, this is not an allegorical painting. Uh, he explains the idea, he doesn't paint the idea, and the idea is her solitude and um, uh, just everything else around her literally goes flat. And so this is exactly what is happening in Debussy uh, with uh, what uh, Lydia Gore uh, uh, in her fantastic article about the opera describes as uh, Mitter Lincoln technique of external diminution where flatness and uh, uh, monotony rule. So this is exactly uh, what translates into the opera. Uh, another uh, iconic uh, privy image uh, where you have, um, so you have here three female bathers, completely just, just uh, very, very common uh, uh, subject, but uh, it's different because here you have this idyll of reverie and displacement and uh, emotional remove uh, with the attitude of introspection, self-absorption, and um, uh, this aloneness, this metaphysical isolation becomes symbolic. Uh, and that is something that is just completely in uh, the uh, symbolist place and the operas as well. So again, nothing happens. Uh, and so nothing has to be explained. Uh, you just uh, uh, absorb. Uh, just very quickly, so uh, the Pivet de Chavon was very, very influential. And so you could see here, this is a painting by uh, much better known to uh, us now, Georges Seurat, uh, who is uh, replicating the scene with the same model in three poses against his famous um, tableau of the uh, uh, Grand Jat, which incidentally, again, has this uh, processional quality that's very quiet, very flat, very basic, very pared down uh, um, thing. And then he also, PV also influences Pablo Picasso. This is a blue uh, period uh, painting, uh, The Tragedy, uh, which is, um, uh, again, the same kind of theme of isolation and alienation and the predicament of modern man and uh, uh, people are subjected, as we all <laughs> are experiencing now, are subjected to much larger forces than uh, they can uh, predict. Um, and then there were people uh, who painted the, the same subjects uh, once they became fashionable. So look at the date here. This is 1899, so fairly late. This is a, a French painter who is known generally as a, a post-impressionist uh, impressionist sort of. Uh, but here he is uh, painting the fashionable theme of the, this is all uh, PV generated of the sacred woods and uh, all, all that. Um, uh, more serious actors in the scene were uh, Maurice Denis, who was actually, so Denis and Cerisier, they were actually uh, in, uh, uh, in a personal contact uh, with the musicians. And, um, and uh, 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 so there was much um, uh, uh, closer understanding of the same symbolist ideals. Uh, so Denis from early age wanted to be a, a Christian painter. Uh, when he saw uh, in 87 that Pivi de Chavan exhibition, it had a huge a uh, huge effect on him. And so this is the painting I wanted you to see. Uh, and the painting, by the way, was owned uh, also by uh, a symbolist poet. Um, so the painting uh, is comes around the time when he already has very close links uh, with many people in the musical milieu. And he's collaborating on all sorts of things uh, with uh, uh, composers and, and poets. So he's in the thick of um, uh, symbolist, um, uh, symbolist uh, um, action. <laughs> uh, this is a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, so in the green trees, the landscape uh, in uh, um, uh, and the location is interesting because the location, the the uh, Caer Duel, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. This is where uh, the famous King Arthur would have lived, right? So you have this medieval reference. So you have the young girl picking flowers by the sea and um, uh, it's a dreamlike ceremony. And it's a, what, what we're looking at is a dramatized 
uh, allegory of uh, this magic forest. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, uh, interesting, again, so if you're trying to make an argument, if you're kind of trying to draw parallels between musical renditions of symbolist thought and um, uh, the painterly ones, you're probably going to hit a wall here because uh, you'd have to be talking about uh, things like transparency, uh, obscurity, uh, and um, uh, trying to, to, to uh, change uh, perhaps the expected ways of representing and knowing, but uh, that's about as far as uh, we can go in terms of interpretation. Um, one aspect that I'll mention just very briefly because it has, um, it kind of, it has more of a, um, uh, it has uh, more of a historic interest. Um, uh, there are common sources, but uh, uh, not so much on the level of enlightening us about the opera. Is this figure um, the, uh, who called himself Lazar? Uh, so this is a, a self-given um, title. Josephine Peladon was a French novelist and um, a man about town who is known for his uh, salons of Rose and Cross, where, where his ambition was he was pursuing beauty. And again, there's, it's quite complicated. He was trying to push back uh, against um, the decimation of uh, uh, Catholicism, official Catholicism at the time. So this is kind of a search for alternative spirituality with a static uh, band uh, with uh, also some decadent, very, uh, like they were seriously uh, disturbing occult um, uh, uh, branches of that. But um, so for the purposes of today, so he uh, set up those salons uh, that were known for, uh, and this is again, the first one was called in the same Durand Royal Gallery where P.V. de Chavannes showed in 87. Um, and the events were partly, they were exhibitions, but they were also, they had musical component. And this is where uh, Eric Satie uh, comes in as uh, one of the musicians and composers. So we'll just, I'm kind of uh, skipping, uh, skipping, have two minutes left. Um, so, uh, Puvi de Chavan comes back uh, in, in person with, uh, he's doing a frontispiece for Eric Satie's uh, piece of music. So there's a lot of um, uh, sort of exchanges. More sphinxes, uh, the despair of the sphinx. Uh, this is um, Alexandre Sion, who was part of the uh, uh, Rose and Cross Salon. So again, this uh, uh, sort of, the, 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 it's this eerie, uh, temptress, um, uh, uh, she is going to cause trouble, but here she's despairing, uh, more uh, uh, disturbing <laughs> uh, visions of uh, things that uh, endanger one's soul. So this is all uh, along the lines of what Wiesmanns is doing. And here's another Sphinx for good measure and more corpses and um, uh, the, the symbol of the human nature emerging from animal nature, etc., cetera. Um, and kind of, you know, more of the same, basically, you have um, uh, quite a bit of this um, uh, musing on the esoteric. Uh, all right, so uh, since I'm all but out of time, I'm just going to more of the sacred woods here. So this is, again, this is something that feeds into the idiom shown in the opera. And finally, that is something that leads uh, also, uh, and this is, of course, that predates it, but again, uh, we, we're not after facts. They're kind of floating tendencies. Uh, this is possibly the ever first abstract painting, a synthesis painting by Serizier. Um, so, uh, back to the initial image, uh, that uh, painting of uh, dreaming, dream as a theme, uh, Puvis de Chavan. So, um, here's the funny thing. This is uh, the symbolist version of action time. Um, nothing is happening. In fact, uh, the subject is asleep. And uh, you have uh, this complete resignation from excessive theatricality of any sort, or even people being awake, 
um, uh, in favor of um, uh, uh, the, the sort of quiet repose. And uh, so Debussy's musical technique uh, really enhanced uh, uh, the symbolist uh, meaning of Peleus, uh, allowing the music to reduce to mere expression uh, of uh, uh, what uh, Mitterling uh, was trying to make an expressible. So the, the focus here is on the music. And so the um, uh, symbol, uh, the, the symbol that is in the uh, Peleus, uh, it might be uh, a complete work of art, but it refuses, uh, because it's a symbolist uh, work of art, uh, to claim any sort of exterior expression. And uh, it is uh, performed visually uh, just as it is refusing to be performed. It's a true impression of beauty, uh, Debussy wrote, uh, that can offer no other effect than silence. Thank you. Wow. Uh Brava, what a fascinating, gorgeous presentation. Um, I don't know, I mean- um, My apologies about the missing bits. I No, 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 those images are, I'm, I'm steeping, uh, I think like a lot of our, our wonderful participants, I'm, I'm kind of steeping in those images right now and I feel like I need to have a silent lunch of images, <laughs> right? Um, Friends, if you want to use the Q&A function or the chat, we might have a few moments where we could um, ask Julia a few questions. Julia, is it possible for us to have that PowerPoint? Um, yes, I don't, yeah. That would be, yeah, yeah. I'd love to, again, really go in and sit with some of those images. Um, in fact, and, what I might, um, I might uh, what I should probably do is I should uh, record the rest of it. So you okay. Have to talk oh, for, for the upload. Well, bonus, fantastic. Yeah. That yeah, would be an it's, extra. It's only ten more minutes, probably. I'm I'm really spoiled. I have um, I teach now in both cases. I have three hour lectures with a twenty minute break. Yeah. So it really ruined my ability to <laughs> have that have that uh, yeah. you know something. But the, the well, I'll always think down. that I have another half hour left. So. Exactly. Um, I think uh, you're getting some lovely thanks for sharing your analysis and thoughts and images uh, from some of our folks. Um, friends, I, I know we, we've had a very rich, rich, rich dense morning um, that, uh, uh, and um, filled with meaning and with yearning for meaning. Um, a lot of comments from panelists. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hey friends, how about this? Why don't we unmute for a moment and can we give everybody a, a giant, give Dr. Friedman a very lovely, large round of applause. Silent. So, come back. We want you to come back to, uh, we want you to come back.